Welcome to the Citizens Band Radio Hour. Thoughtful conversations that explore issues of media and journalism, democracy and citizenship. The Citizens Band Radio Hour is sponsored by the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. You can visit the center online at mediaandcitizenship.org. Here's your host, Coy Barefoot. It's always a great thrill to talk with my friend Tom Frank, best-selling and award-winning author. His books include Pity the Billionaire, The Wrecking Crew, and What's the Matter with Kansas. He's a former columnist for the Wall Street Journal and Harper's, the founding editor of The Baffler, and he writes regularly for Salon. His most recent book is Listen Liberal, or Whatever Happened to the Party of the People. Thomas Frank, welcome to the program, sir. Hey, Coy. It's great to be here. Your book really is uh, its the stone-cold truth that many liberals and progressives just don't want to talk about. It's, there, there really isn't a lot of self-reflection and critical thinking. There's such a team mentality that, well, this is our team, love it or leave it, and you are really holding up a mirror to, to the yeah. Democratic Party and saying, look, this is, this is what you've become, and it ain't pretty. Yeah, well, that's very nice of you to put it that way. That's that's exactly what I was aiming for, and I, I am su- I was surprised when I wrote it, and am surprised now the, the the book is out there at how little self reflection, you know, how little self understanding there is among uh, liberals. You know, they uh, they sort of uh, come up with these endless uh, theories about conservatives. I myself do this, right? I wrote What's the Matter with Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> the wrecking crew. That's me. I wrote that. Uh, uh, but but they they aren't willing to speculate, uh, you know, in an equal way about themselves and who they are and why why things work the way they do. It's such a peculiar world we live in, you know. Yeah. So I put up a post recently on Facebook where I enjoy talking about these things, and and I said. Um, I made a point that was right out of your book that, you know, President Obama would, would not have accomplished the kind of hope and change that he ran on even without Republican obstructionism. And the liberal uh, diehards chimed in and said, oh, no, you're so wrong. You, you don't get it. Everything Obama would have done so much more if it weren't for the Republicans. There's always this knee jerk. We must blame the Republicans for everything. There's never this sense that, no, you know what? We did that or, or we yep. wouldn't have done that. <laughs> That's exactly right. And there's the thing about Obama, it's, um, you know, we had, so we put so much, I'm speaking for myself here, but I think a lot of people probably shared, you know, my point of view on him, which was in 2008, I had, you know, I was so emotionally committed to him, uh, you know, to the hope uh, and the change and all that stuff. And it's, um, it's, it's like, uh, it's like we're weighed down by that. You know, we, we we can't acknowledge that it didn't work out the way we wanted it to. It's that's that's too much to ask of people, and so they have to come up with uh, you know all of these ways of people want to believe basically that Obama was a you know one of the greatest presidents. They they want to believe that, and uh, so they basically his his biggest fans now uh, go out there and argue that in fact you know the presidency is not a very powerful job. All these things to get him off the hook. It's like our whole idea of history has to be distorted in order for our hope to still be pure. You know, the feelings that we had in 2008, in order for those to still be intact, we have to believe all this other stuff. So let's get into this book. Personally, what I enjoy so much about this book, it's the same reason I enjoy works by Rick Perlstein. It's really in-depth political history. It goes into, beyond the headlines, into the history. This is where this idea came from, and this is when this started, and it's so fascinating. It goes back many decades and looks at how the the modern Democratic Party came into being and evolved out of the real progressive movements and uh, of the the sixties and seventies. And you yeah. write. Let's. I think the best place to start is nineteen seventy one. Nineteen seventy one, of course, is the year of the infamous Powell Memo. I'm going to ask you to tell people about the Powell Memo, which was secretive. But then, as you write, the very same year, there was a kind of Powell memo for the left that was not secret at all. It was Fred Dutton's book, Changing Sources of Power. 
Tell us about 1971, the Powell memo, and Dutton's book, and put those in the context of what was going to unfold over the next few decades. Well, this was the big change, you know. Well, when I was when I was studying history, we used to say the big change, meaning you know, the 30s. But the the big change of our time is, of course, the 60s and the the, the 70s. And uh, the the Powell memo, as a lot of your listeners probably know, was you know was written by Lewis Powell later, a Supreme Court justice, but was a confidant of President Nixon. And uh, basically, it was uh, it was the plan for uh, the revival of the conservative movement. He sort of sketched it all out in a secret memo that he sent around to, uh, you know, a small number of his of his colleagues. And uh, a lot of people have have you know really latched onto this and uh, you know described it at length and see it as a blueprint for the entire conservative movement ever since. Uh, what fascinates me though uh, in, in in listen liberal was this. this the, the Powell Memo of the Democrats, which was were not secret. It wasn't just circulated to a few people. It was uh, written. Uh, it was a book. I don't think it was a bestseller, but it was, a, you know, it was a popular book. You can get a paperback of it easily on Amazon, you know, for a penny or whatever, you know. And uh, it's called Changing Sources of Power. It's written by Frederick Dutton, who was a uh, Democratic power broker. He was a right-hand man to Bobby Kennedy, among other things. Um, he later became a lobbyist, I believe, for Saudi Arabia. <laughs> you know, oh uh, he, he was a, he was a DC player. <laughs> yeah. Let's put it that way. And uh, but in nineteen he he in the early seventies he served on something called the McGovern Commission, which the Democrats set up after uh, you know the debacle of nineteen sixty eight. They set up a commission to reform the, their party and to uh you know to 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 change the way they chose their presidential candidates and this is where we get the uh, uh you know primary elections from before uh then there were very few primary elections and then after the McGovern commission basically that's the system that we use both parties now in order to choose the president uh, or to to choose our presidential candidates I should say and uh when the democrats did this you know it was it was a it was, you know, it was a good idea for all sorts of reasons, uh, you know, and the stuff that they did was, you know, very populist, and it opened up the party in all sorts of ways, very healthy, uh, as we're seeing uh, this year. But it also did, uh, it did some other structural things which are not so healthy, uh, and one of them is they basically removed uh, organized labor from its structural position within the Democratic Party, and uh, at the time. This probably seemed like a you know not a bad idea. Uh, organized labor was uh, you know was was like a dinosaur. It was very slow moving. It tended to be very conservative. It was very white. A lot of the unions weren't uh, very democratic, uh, and uh, so it, it it kind of made and and most importantly, uh, a lot of unions had been on the wrong side of the Vietnam War issue. And that was really the the tipping point. That's where everything changed back in those days. So, uh, you know, so the McGovern Commission did what it did, and we can understand why they did what they did. What they didn't see happening, of course, was that once you remove, you know, the sort of structural voice or or, or structural power of working people's organizations, you also remove working people's issues. Uh, from your party, and that didn't become manifest for a long time. And this was a recommendation uh, that was explicit in Dutton's book in seventy yeah, one. Explicit, yeah. yes. He says that basically, uh, we we you know the the he, the legatees of the New Deal, the people who benefited from the New Deal, we have to uh, basically they're now uh, they're they're against us. They're they're on the wrong side of history, and we have to you know the Democratic Party has to find new constituencies. And the main new constituency that he was really excited about was yeah, it, it makes me almost sick to uh, to talk about this stuff. But it was um, um, the counterculture. You know, it, it was uh, enlightened, college-educated young people. It was the professional class, uh, the rising white-collar affluent professional class. These people were supposed to be so enlightened, and everybody could see that blue-collar people were, you know, reactionary fools. And, you know, we had to, the Democrats had to reorganize themselves as a party of, you know, uh, dominated by, led by uh, professionals. Uh, 
Uh, and th- this is very much in keeping with the kind of, uh, you know, can I take a step back here? Corey? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, wh- when I when I was younger, my first book, which um, I don't know if anybody's read, any, it, it, my first book is about the '60s and about the way the counterculture was received and understood by the establishment culture, and particularly by the advertising industry. This is my book. It was called The Conquest of Cool that I wrote a long time ago. And um, one thing I learned when I wrote that was that there is, you know, a lot of real establishment types in this country saw in the counterculture and like the, you know, the, the, the kids at the fancy colleges, you know, who cared so much about everything. They, they really, they didn't see this as a threat. They saw this as a kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, a millennial thing. They thought, they thought this was absolutely wonderful. Uh, you know, they thought this was this sort of advent of, well, <laughs> it's the, uh, it's the age of Aquarius. Right, <laughs> you right. know, some of the people that fell for this the most were these establishment types, so like Frederick Dutton. And this book, the coming, you know, Changing Sources of Power, is absolutely filled with this kind of credulity about youth culture that's almost embarrassing to read. But here's the screwy thing. This guy was one of the players on the McGovern Commission. He was one of the ones who made this choice to, you know, forget about organized labor and choose this other group instead. And so uh, in 1970... Know, enlightened it, young professionals. Yeah. So in 1972, with the McGovern Commission, one year after his book, he's at the table making this decision, and we see in that year this very explicit conscious decision on the part of the Democratic Party to abandon the FDR party, the working class, and embrace the baby boomers and, and to basically yeah. give the party over to the boomers. Yes, but let's let, let, just so your, your, your listeners aren't confused, when people in this era talked about the baby boomers, they didn't mean uh, baby boomers who served in Vietnam. They didn't mean baby boomers who worked on an assembly line. Uh, they meant baby boomers who went to fancy colleges. By the way, they also didn't mean baby boomers who went to uh, community college. They meant baby boomers who were at the, you know, at, at yeah. The sort it's a great point. It's a great school. point. It's so it's not a generational thing. It's a class thing. Exactly. So yeah. we say it's a generation thing, but in fact, it was a class thing. A generation, generations in class, classes are often confused in, yeah. in American yeah. life. And this was the, this was a period when that was at its worst. But yeah, that is what happened in the in the early seventies, and. Uh, they were explicitly saying we have to turn away from the New Deal. And this went on for years and years and years, all through the 70s, all through the 80s, all through the 90s. Uh, all of these Democratic uh, Party thinkers, uh, you know, who write for, their, for the Democratic Party magazines and who run for office, uh, all of them were saying that we all know what the answer to the Democrats' problems are, and it's always the same thing. They have to turn away from the New Deal. And there's all these different factions in the Democratic Party in those days, and they fought over all sorts of different things. Like McGovern's faction was called the New Politics, uh, you know, group. There's another faction called the Democratic Leadership Council, which was a very conservative group. Uh, and there was there was an, another one called the Neo Liberals. But all of these groups, and they, and they disagreed on all sorts of things. But they all agreed that the uh, that the New Deal was over. The New Deal had to end, and that Democrats had to turn away from working people and had to become the party of affluent white-collar professionals. Best-selling author Tom Frank is with us. The book is Listen Liberal, or Whatever Happened to the Party of the People, and that's what we're finding out right now. (laughs) What did happen to the Party of the People? You mentioned the DLC, 1985, white Southern Democrats step forward, form this group, and the future popular president comes out of that group, does he not? And you you can connect these ideological, I love... I know you do too. I love connecting these these dots and this ideological lineage from Bill Clinton and the DLC and the McGovern Commission. It's it's just so so fascinating. Tell us Bill Clinton's story and how he comes out of the DLC and finally realizes the dreams of the of the McGovern Commission of seventy two. Yeah, well, the, it, so Clinton uh, is is as you just said, he was the leader of the Democratic Leadership Council, or uh, he was more of a figurehead for the Democratic Leadership Council, uh, and he was a sort of star guy, and and he ran for you know his his primary campaign was basically the Democratic Leadership Council was who helped him out, so he was a product of this con- group of conservative Democrats, but he also had a foot in the other camp, in the uh, McGovern camp, and he was uh, a baby boomer who 
went to these fancy colleges. You know, he went to Georgetown and uh, Yale Law School. He was a Rhodes Scholar. And if you read, uh, you know, the sort of the, the the biographies of Bill Clinton, that the the ones where they where the the biographer really really likes him, they will often describe him as a leader of his generation of the you know the baby boom generation. So he's sort of he embodies all of the different strains that I'm describing the 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 baby boomer worship the um McGovern, uh, new politics type, and, and the Democratic Leadership Council. Yeah. All of them are brought together in his, uh, you know, in his person. It is, and yeah. he becomes president. He's in, that part of the, he's the part of that Venn diagram right in the middle where all the circles interconnect. Yeah, with him. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess Hillary, too. You know, she's, a, she's there. She's there as well. I mean, this is a woman who, I mean, think about it, uh, started out her career working for the, uh, um, uh, Oh geez, what's the name of the group? The uh, Children's uh, Defense Fund or whatever. Children's it is. Legal Defense uh, Fund. Also yeah. work, working for McGovern, and then saw <laughs> the board of Walmart. You know, <laughs> these, these are people who are in who, who bridge these different worlds without any problem. And that's one of the takeaways from your book is to really sort of pull back the layers of the very concept of this professional class that came out of the '70s as this rising generation. And really understand who they are, and they are not yeah. they are not people who represent the interests of of working class voters and even the middle class that's right well they don't they don't represent those voters, and they also they, they really don't care about those voters I mean they will say that they do you know and Bill Clinton, if you read the sort of official uh, versions of his presidency or his own account of his presidency he'll always say that he's he's the great you know friend of of, of working America or something you know they, they always say stuff like that but in, in point of fact so what I did uh, to study the Clinton years is I read um, uh, uh, books by his admirers. I didn't read any of the kind of right-wing hate literature about Bill Clinton, which is, by the way, all coming back now. Donald Trump is bringing oh, yeah. it all back up, all the <laughs> right-wing hate stuff about him. So yeah. I, didn't, I didn't mess with any of that. I, I didn't go into his affairs, uh, except for Monica Lewinsky does come up in a kind of a critical moment, a critical juncture of his presidency. But other than that, I didn't go into any of that stuff. I, I only read the favorable accounts of him. Uh, or the uh, you know the, the responsible biographies of him, uh, and I used that to construct my account of, of, of his presidency and what he actually did as as president. So you know if you if you put all that sort of crazy stuff aside, you know the conspiracy theories about him, and ask what he actually did, it's it's actually not a very pretty picture. You know we remember the '90s as good times because towards the end of the '90s the economy was just going like crazy. You know, and and uh, job growth was out of control. Wages actually went up for the first, well, just about the only time uh, in a lot of people's uh, memories. I mean, certainly in my memory, that was the only really sustained good times we've had. And uh, uh, so people often look back at Bill Clinton with with great fondness. But if you look at the things he actually did, they're all of them are terrible. Every single one of them has uh, has yielded disaster. Do you want me to go over what they are? Yeah, let let let's do that. And you, then, uh, you, be, yeah, because that that really is the uh, and just to sort of underscore what you what you've been saying, this this book really looks in depth at the the policy decisions that came as a result of that uh, sea change in the seventies in the Democratic Party and then into the eighties. What were the policy results? Uh, and yeah. politics, but what were really what were they doing when they got into power? And uh, you know, to cut to the chase, they were doing what Republicans did. <laughs> they sure. they were it, absolutely it was, yeah. It, it was similar to what Republicans did, but it's uh, it, it, the the argument about the professional class is is actually really fascinating because it's more than just that this is the the democrats number one constituency it was of course and this is the group that they that they do everything in their power to help this is a group that does very well when democrats are in office but democrats also uh, produce this literature uh, arguing that the professional class is the sort of chosen class of history that they are you know like how, how uh uh, Marxists would do with the proletariat is what they sort of do with the uh, the professional class. That these are the people. All everything in history points their way. They stand at the very you know the telos uh, of history. You know they are the winners. And so the Democratic Party uh, uh, deliberately and consciously remakes itself as a party of 
of winners of of the sort of winners of of the post industrial society. And Tom, before uh, you talk about class. Tom, before you talk about Clinton's policies in the nineties, and we'll no, I'm look sorry, at, I got si- no, I, but, it's yeah, very easy for me to get sidetracked, and that's totally uh, you fine. Got, you that's, look out for that. Coy. That's how you. That's how you and I talk about these things. It's so much fun. But I also want to throw. I want to throw in a, a a tangent here about exactly what you're talking about. This idea that the uh, the Democrats the party. Um, really was taken over by this professional class, and it became their whole purpose of being, and it was the fulfillment of, uh, you know, they saw themselves as history has led up to this point. And I found in that whole idea, really, it's, it's, a, it's the new version of the 18th century elite, the Jefferson, the Washington, the Hamiltons, the Madisons, who absolutely saw themselves in the very same way. Adam Smith wrote about them. Aristotle wrote about this, that this, this, it, there will be the, in society an elite, educated class who has more leisure than somebody who's working for a living, quote-unquote, and it is their, not responsibility, it is their due to lead government, to, to be in power. And it's a, of course, it's a, a circular, self-serving um, yes, way of thinking. But you, you, that's a really important point there. And the, the thing is that w- with a guy like Jefferson, at least, Jefferson, there's some recognition that this is also a um, – this is not a democratic way of doing things, you know. So that is that is absolutely correct, uh, and this this goes way back in the history of America. But it's that was a, t- a time also that was swept away in the Jacksonian period when they when they decided that no, yep, yep. being ruled by an elite is not democratic. Right, <laughs> exactly. You know, we don't want to do that anymore, and that was the end of you know like the Federalists and all, and all of these people. Now it's back. Just to continue that thread and pull it through. Arguably, it came back in the 20s. I mean, in public opinion in 1922 with Walter Lippmann, you see this argument that the experts should be the one to run government. And you sort of see this, the seeds being planted of what would become what you call in your book the professional class. You see Lippmann talking about this, these people with these young men with impressive degrees who went to the good schools, and they're smart and they're experts you have uh, the city manager book, uh, 1927, by Leonard White, where he argues that the whole world is embracing this idea of government by experts. And that sort of lays the groundwork. We see Democrats thinking even in the 20s that, we, that, the, that the future power of the world will be with the, the very educated, the person with the most degrees behind their name, and, and this class of experts who will take over. And the Democrats finally did that in the 90s with Bill yeah, Clinton. They, yes, they did. So that's, that's one of the uh, reasons that I wrote this book. I mean, to be, to be very uh, frank with you, and that is my name, so I'm, I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> um, they, uh, it, look, so when, I, when you know, Barack Obama came in in 2009, one of the reasons that I was so excited about, about him was that we had just been through this administration of hacks and cronies, you know, the Bush people with the – remember <laughs> Michael Brown? <laughs> yeah, remember yeah, this? yeah, of After course. After Hurricane Katrina, what a disaster this guy was. It was the very antithesis of the idea of government by experts. Yeah, and, so, and so I was very excited because you know, Barack Obama, one thing we knew about him is that he would bring in uh, talented people to run everything. And it was a, you know, the, the, this terrible uh, stock market crash and the bailouts of Wall Street was underway. And, it, you know, uh, it, it, I wanted to have government by intelligent people. I was excited about that. I was enthusiastic about that. And look what happened. I mean, nothing changed. The you know, on the important matter, the most important matter of what to do about Wall Street. Essentially, nothing changed. Having uh, you know, the, the smartest people in the country rather than a collection of hacks and cronies turned out to mean the same thing, and that that was shocking to me. And that's sort of the genesis of this book. And I asked myself when I, you know, there's another uh, antecedent here that, that you didn't mention, which is a famous book written again in, in the seventies called the best and the brightest. And it's about the Vietnam war yeah, and course. about how the, the, the sort of, uh, uh, international relations and uh, political science professions, uh, got us into the Vietnam war and kept us in there. When all the evidence <laughs> said, this is a bad idea, they, you know, they managed to overlook that and, and, and just kept going. And it was, you know, this catastrophe brought to you, again, by meritocracy. And so I, I said to myself, well, gee whiz, 
has there ever been a time when meritocracy worked? You know, when when having when government by expert actually worked? Because this is something that seems like a good idea to me. How can this? How come it always fails? And and I thought about this. And there there is a period. It is actually really interesting. There is a period when it worked. Uh, and it was the Franklin Roosevelt administration. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's worked a lot of times, but it worked resoundingly well in the Franklin Roosevelt administration, where he, you know, he had his famous brain trust, and they, you know, they were they were heroes, uh, and they they didn't do everything right, but they did a lot of things. They did, I mean, come on, they got us out of the depression. They won World War II. They, it was, a, you know, it was a great time. It was when government actually worked. But I, I tell you, Coy, so when you compare. The uh, cabinet of the uh, Barack Obama's uh, inner circle of advisors, or Bill Clinton's inner circle of advisors, or Hillary's inner, inner circle of advisors, to the Roosevelt administration, you notice something shocking right away, which is nowadays it's uh, the advisors of these people are always drawn from, as you said, these this very small number of elite colleges and elite graduate schools, elite programs. It's very small number of places. You look at, you know, it's always Harvard. You know that. Uh, or with uh, with Obama, it's always these, you know, guys from Oxford, Rhodes Scholars, um, and it's very concentrated. It's just a handful of institutions uh, of schools that he draws all of his advisors from. You look at Roosevelt. Roosevelt was a Harvard man. So is Obama. But Roosevelt took his advisors from all over the country, from all different walks of life. They were highly intelligent people, but they had come from. All sorts of different experiences, uh, it, you know, uh, small town bankers. <laughs> one of my, the, he had a lot of really interesting people working for him. But one of the best is this guy Mariner Eccles, who ran the Federal Reserve, was a small town banker from Utah. I love that. He's not some, not some Harvard guy. He's a small town banker from Utah, or uh, his attorney general Robert Jackson was a lawyer with no law degree. This is a guy that was the prosecutor at Nuremberg. Later, they put him on the Supreme Court. Harry Truman was the last U.S. president. That didn't he was Roosevelt's VP? Didn't go to college. Uh, you know, you go right down the list. Harry Hopkins, his uh, Roosevelt's right hand man during World War II, was a social worker from Iowa. You know, Henry Wallace, also from Iowa, uh, edited a magazine for farmers. It's these people with very, very different life experiences. And Roosevelt, he did have a lot of Ivy Leaguers working for him, but even they were a different sort of species of Ivy Leaguer than what you see in Washington today. There are people like uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, right, who was in the uh, Office of Price Administration during World War II. And this is a guy who spent his entire life uh, fighting against what he called the conventional wisdom. You know, which is absolutely the opposite, the opposite of, the way of where we are now. Today. Yeah, I mean, conventional is where we are. You know, that's that's today when you hire all these Harvard guys and all these um, people at the very top, you know, from these very top schools, what you're getting is orthodoxy, and that's what that's the problem. That and this is the professional class never understands this that they are actually servants of orthodoxy. The people who are at the top of the profession aren't necessarily the best. They're the ones, they're the ones who have uh, reiterated the catchphrases most ably or whatever it is. They, they're not the best. They're the most orthodox. And if I'm sitting in a boardroom on Wall Street, that's what I want in Washington. I want orthodoxy. I want the same regardless of party because it makes it easier to place my bets. Right? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> We're talking with Tom Frank. The book is Listen Liberal, or Whatever Happened to the Party of the People. Tom, stay with me. We'll take a very quick break, and there's more when we get back.
My guest is Tom Frank, best-selling and celebrated author. His latest book is Listen, Liberal, or Whatever Happened to the Party of the People. Tom, you like how I threw in the little voice accent there on the title, Listen, Liberal? Because every time I see it, that, that's what I'm thinking you're saying. Like, hey, listen up. <laughs> that's exactly right. Listen yeah. up, liberal. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 you have to say it in this kind of Kansas voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 there's a C. Wright Mills uh, title called Listen, Yankee, that I was uh, kind of hoping to, uh, uh, you know, I was, sort of, I was sort of hoping to emulate emulate that. He, there's there's a, a couple of C. Wright Mills references in the book, the sociologist from the 1950s. I guess the last sort of uh, celebrity sociologist, maybe the only celebrity sociologist <laughs> we've ever had in this country. So let's look at the at the 90s. This professional class that, uh, that comes out of the Democratic Party takes over in the 70s and 80s. They get their first president in Bill Clinton, and yet we don't see policies that benefit the working class. We see policies no, no, that, that make you it know, possible to we no. see policies that make it possible to destroy the middle class. Yeah, that's right. Well, you look so you can summarize the Bill Clinton uh, years with uh, you know he had five main accomplishments. And by the way, these are things that his admirers like about him. This is what they when they what they used to point to and they'd say why he's a great president. Uh, and it's uh, NAFTA, remember the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and then he had a whole bunch of other free trade agreements afterwards, but that was the first one. That was the big fight. That was the the landmark. So you have NAFTA, the crime bill of '94, welfare reform, bank and telecom deregulation, and then the balanced budget. And every single one of those, well, every single one of those was a Republican issue that he took over and made his own. And every single one of those ended in disaster. All of them uh, have just been. You know, brought ruin to this country. You know, the, the, you look at you look at NAFTA. None of the things they were, you know, they were saying it would it would <laughs> increase our uh, exports. It would help out our trade deficit. It would increase American manufacturing and employment. It did exactly the opposite. We have this enormous trade deficit with uh, with Mexico now, and uh, employers routinely use NAFTA as a threat. Uh, with their workers, with their workforce, if they complain in the slightest, uh, if they threaten to organize, if they thre- if they are organized and threaten and demand, uh, you know, uh, better wages or something like that, they, this is always it, it gave these people this, you know, weapon to use uh, at any time. We're going to move the plant, they say. They always, and this is very common. They say it all the time. Sometimes they even do it. Uh, you look at uh, the crime bill. Well, everybody has been talking about that. Uh, you know, it's been this complete sea change in the way we understand that. Uh, I was angry about it at the time, and now I've discovered the whole country is so all upset about it. Or you look at uh, welfare reform. Now this is on the front pages. I saw a story in the New York Times about this just the other day. People are starting to say, you know, this it was not really a good idea to end this uh this program that we inherited from the days of the New Deal, uh, and then at the same time as it, so, all of these things you've noticed these are these are about uh, disciplining or punishing uh, poor and working class people. NAFTA, the Crime Bill, uh, welfare reform, all of these things are about that. Then look at the other thing: bank deregulation. It's about so while at the very same moment we're cracking down on low-level drug users and we're throwing the poor off of welfare and we're you know uh, busting unions you know or, or giving management sort of ultimate power over uh, over workers while we're doing all these things at the same time uh, uh, the Clinton administration is literally rolling back the rules for Wall Street. You know, <laughs> repealing all the old laws that used to bind them, and you know, so money becomes, uh, you know, money is liberated at the same moment as everybody else uh, gets to learn discipline. It's crazy, but that's that's the Clinton. It's not crazy. It's it makes sense. That's Clintonism. You know, that's what it's all about. One class of Americans is treated one way. Everybody else is treated. You know, a different way. Uh, one class gets this kind of, uh, you know, uh, heaven on earth. You know, this kind of good times like they have never seen before, like no one has ever seen before. And everybody else gets the whip hand. You know, uh, and that's who we were then. And that's that's sort of that's the way uh, uh, Democrats rule nowadays. They they legislate uh, to benefit one group and to punish. Uh, other groups and the, the groups that are punished tend to be 
working people and the poor. Let me pull the camera way back here, Tom, and just throw out a, a thesis and see if you agree with it. In, in a very real sense, Clinton's new Democrats, quote unquote, which you know comes out of the, the decisions made by Democrats in the 70s, we need to change. You get these new Democrats, which take over in the 90s. They become, in a very real sense, what the GOP used to be in this country, while the GOP, thanks to Goldwater and Reagan and movement conservatism, they, they moved further to the right and made the GOP something else entirely. What, uh, you know, what Chris Hedges says, you know, a, a, a slow motion corporate coup d'etat, very much of a counter revolution against the progressive movements of the 60s and 70s. The entire political spectrum shifts to the right and abandons the, the 99 percent of the American people who no longer feel like, wait a minute, this whole system doesn't serve me any, anymore. In fact, it punishes me. Yeah, that's right. That, that, that's right. I mean, that's that's a little overdrawn. I would say, um, I, you know, uh, the, the, the thing is that the Republicans keep pulling to the right. You know, they keep moving to the right. As we know, you know, Bill Clinton uh, gave them concession after concession after concession. You know, he got NAFTA passed. That, that was one of their big ideas. He got welfare reform passed, another one of their one of their big proposals. You know, he got bank deregulation done. Uh, Republicans had been, or I'm sorry, Republicans had had a lot of trouble getting that done. You know, Reagan had had all sorts of problems. He wanted to get bank deregulation done, but he couldn't. It was Clinton that did it. Uh, all of these, you know, but as he's doing these things, the Republican party itself pulls further and further you know it's always moving the goalposts further and further to the right because that's how they play the game and so what you find is that a lot of the constituencies in this country are motivated by uh well by a sort of really awful emotions right fear of the republicans for people like me you know that's what's and, and this is being ramped up again right now where we're, we're going to have an election where it's all about your fear and hate of Donald Trump, or alternately for the uh, Republicans, this sort of, you know, sort of crazy fears about the Democrats that I've been writing about all these years, you know, these, these sort of conspiracy theories that they're forever dreaming up about who the Democrats are. So we're all motivated by fear and hate of of one another and and look at look at the policies that get passed in the meantime you know it's, it's these are terrible things but there's one place where i would correct what you're saying it's not the 99% versus the 1% it's the top 10% okay the the top, the profession whenever you try to understand why inequality you know keeps galloping along uh, and there, there, you know, and the president, President Obama, you know, who's been so eloquent on the subject, just throws up his hands. Nothing he can he can do about it. Uh, well, why is that? Well, part of it is because there is a constituency for inequality. There are people who really like it, and it's not just the top, you know, the point oh one percent or something like that. It's about the top ten percent of the population has done very well. The reason this is not comfortable for people to talk about and not comfortable for people to even admit is because those people are Democrats, that top 10 percent. This is the professional class. They have done extremely well uh, you know, in the age of inequality. These are the people in the McMansions and this kind of thing, uh, and they like inequality. It served them splendidly. Uh, they have no interest in, in changing it uh, or reversing course. So now we can go back to 71 and 72 in the decisions that were coming out of the Democratic Party then. How do we win elections and how do we get back in power? You can see coming out of those decisions, fast forward a few decades, and we're in a really scary place. Our politics are fueled by hate and fear. We see a runaway inequality that, uh, that history is not shy about telling us that this kind of inequality – directly leads to massive social unrest or a police state or both hey it's hey, brother it's here i mean look look around this is this election this is we are eight years after the i'm sorry we're how long are we after the recovery was in 09 we're seven years after the recovery and for something like 70 percent of the american population when you in polls say that we're still in a recession I mean, uh, so in Listen Liberal, I visit some of these places that are never going to come back, like uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, or Decatur, Illinois. Decatur is, is particularly important to me because this is where the first, uh, one of the first pieces of journalism I ever wrote was about a strike uh -huh. in Decatur, Illinois, back yeah. in the, actually in the, in the Clinton era. And I went back there to see what it, what it looks like now, and it's not, it's not pretty. I mean, for people like that, 
this country is coming apart. I mean, they know their middle class lives that like these blue collar guys in Decatur used to have in the 90s, that's gone. Uh, you know, they still have it because they were members of a union and they have a, uh, they have a pension and they have a retirement. Uh, their kids don't have it. Their kids got no chance at it. They've lost it. Uh, and it's horrifying. And this is, this is happening all over this country. The middle class is coming apart. Inequality is growing worse. Uh, you know, that it's not a coincidence that, you know, Trump is echoing Sanders on all of these issues. This phrase that Elizabeth Warren dreamed up, you know, the, the, the economy is rigged. Everybody is saying it now. And, uh, you know, it's just going to get worse. I mean, I think Hillary Clinton is probably going to be elected president. And I don't think anything is going to change. It's going to be like Obama's third term. Uh, nothing is going to change. Inequality is going to, going to grow worse and worse and worse. Uh, and this situation is uh, – the things that, that we dread, they're here. When, when you and I talk about this stuff, I always go back to France. That's, that's our fate if we don't figure out soon enough – our fate, like like any country in human history that reaches this point, your fate could be what happened to France in the 1790s. And to say that it was horrible, it's it's an understatement. I mean, they, they called it the reign of terror. I mean, it was just unspeakable yep. when when the masses of people were they were they had had enough. They had absolutely yep. had enough. Yep. They were so fed up and they wanted change. And you see that anger at a Trump rally and it's palpable yep. at a Sanders rally. Yep, it's it, 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 well, you know, it, it's frightening. Uh, look, I, I'm a big fan of Bernie Sanders, and I, I um, you know, I voted for him here in Maryland. And uh, you know, what's fascinating about him is he is a throwback to the pre 1970s Democratic Party. This yeah. is a guy, uh, you know, he he really admires Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, you know, the New Deal is obviously the model for all of the social programs he's he's proposing, and the Democrats recoil from him as they would from. Something toxic. The, I mean, the, the the party is so. I mean, like the office holders, the official sort of establishment Democratic Party hates this guy, and it's funny because he represents them. He represents what they used to be. It, it is fascinating. Yeah. By the way, I wonder what you think about. We haven't talked for a while. And speaking of Democratic heroes, uh, Jefferson and Hamilton. Man, <laughs> boy, what's going on? <laughs> Hamilton is now this like superstar. But but in an <laughs> How do you age, explain it. But in an age when the Democratic Party turns its back on the working class and becomes the the new GOP, that's totally predictable. That, that yeah, you would, that you, is. I was yeah. wondering if you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. that Hamilton. Everybody would would suddenly discover how how sexy and cool <laughs> Alexander. Yeah, Hamilton if was. only they knew. If only they really knew what he was all about. So, Tom, how does this play out? I mean, really, it's it's just Trump's not going to go away. Trump has obviously shown the party regulars in the GOP. Hey, this is where this is your base now. This is where your base yep. is now. They're with me, and we're not with you. And there is this really dangerous anger out there. And you know what? I'm, I, neither you nor I would dismiss it. They're right to be angry. Yep, they are. They are. They're, they're, their anger is, uh, I mean, he's leading them in all sorts of, like, uh, I think, really dangerous and frightening directions. But he also says things that are obviously true, uh, you know, that are, you know, that, that, that ring true for a lot of these people when he talks about trade and stuff like that, the trade deals. He does it in a kind of a blunt and stupid way. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, he's, uh, he's right about the trade deals. And, uh, <laughs> You know what gets me is watching how the Democrats uh, and how liberals in general deal with this. It's sort of a, uh, you know, and it's by by wagging their finger at these people and scolding these people. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know? as though, as though that's the answer. Yeah, yeah. Like that's going to do anything. You know how? You know what? You know what's what's crazy is you think of how someone like Lyndon Johnson uh, would have just made like really short work of Donald Trump. You know, and it, 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 this is just getting scarier and scarier by the minute because instead we don't have Lyndon Johnson. We don't have Franklin Roosevelt. We don't have John F. Kennedy. We don't have Thomas Jefferson. We have Hillary Clinton. And she is precisely the kind of, I mean, an intelligent person, a well-meaning person, but classic uh, sort of uh, exemplar of the professional class. Uh, she is a technocrat. 
She'll bring in the experts, and they'll run the programs yeah. in exactly the right way. And don't you know that having experts run things is better than having non-experts? And, and besides, and how come people are so upset about the economy? Can't they see that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is way up high? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's scolding, yeah. scolding, scolding these voters. And and that is, if the Democrats didn't have such a lopsided demographic advantage, this is like Dukakis all over again. It's so bad. It's Shays Rebellion all over again. It's it's uh it's the Adams um what was Adams' wife? John Adams' wife. It's it's her in her letter to Jefferson where she's just oh these Shays people you know in Massachusetts they are, they it, they were scolding them then the people they just don't understand they don't get it things are good. Yeah, and they're they're going broke and they're losing their farm and they're going hungry and their kids have no future and uh, but it's 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 just amazing and Hillary Clinton obviously uh, or arguably much more conservative than her husband was. That's right. You're talking about John Adams and his wife. Yes, exactly. Saying? Yeah, that's what I see. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, uh, that now that is a very interesting uh, comparison. I I had not thought of that. Uh, <laughs> well, they exactly scold them. Right. You know, Shay's rebellion. Exactly right. And, they, and Jefferson, of, of course, you know. Was determined to destroy the Federalist Party. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, they <laughs> scold them. They scold the people in 1787 with Shays' Rebellion, in the same way that Hillary Clinton scolds the liberals who saying, "Hey, wait a minute, you don't represent yeah. me." But then you fast forward just a few years to the Whiskey Rebellion, and you have Washington and Hamilton taking an army of 11,000 men into Western Pennsylvania, which was an army bigger than the one they won the revolution with to take that army against American citizens who wouldn't buy into Hamilton and Washington's counter-revolutionary economic schemes to put government in business with business to, to benefit an elite financial class. The people knew what was going on. They weren't stupid, and they were standing up against it, and they weren't scolding them anymore. They were using what was the first police state in America, which was that army going into western Pennsylvania. And uh, oh, that's, that is depressing. Thanks, yeah. boy. You put me in a good mood there. I mean, and, uh, I mean, that's that's something we sort of want to avoid. You know, that's funny. People never talk about that anymore. That's never a historical comparison. But geez, you've done it now. Now, we're, now I'm going to go. I'm going to go dig out the old uh, history books and read up on that. Tom Frank, the latest book, must read. New book. It is absolutely one that you will not want to miss. I promise you. Is listen, liberal, or whatever happened to the party of the people. Tom, we have a few minutes left, and I did want to ask you about, I have to ask you about education, because uh, you write so much about it in your book as this fallback, go-to agenda item for the new Democratic Party, for the, these, yeah. these new Democrats since the 70s, that no matter how bad the world is falling apart, they always stand up and look into the camera and say, the solution is, is education. You gotta, you gotta be one of us. You gotta go to a good school. You want to be one of us. You got to get, got to get an education. And my question for you is, and this is in light of the uh, the work of economist Michael Hudson, who writes about the the fire economy, finance, insurance, and real estate. Yes. What happens when education becomes part of the problem? <laughs> when you when you look at we're there, we're there, yeah. we're there. That's that's happened. That is that has come to pass. Look, I'm a, I, before I say anything else. You're, I'm a great believer in education. I went to UVA. I spent 25 years of my life getting an education. I went out and got a PhD. However, all that said, when Democrats look at any economic problem, they see an education problem. Always. You name the problem. Whatever is going on, they're like, well, you know, the answer is we just need to get more people with STEM degrees, or we need, you know, yeah, we need, yeah. to, or we need to get fewer people with STEM degrees. We need people to study other things, whatever it is. We need pe more people to have to go to college. It's not just a way of brushing the problem off. It's a way of blaming the problem on the individual. So the, the problem is not the, the failure of the economy or the loss of power by workers or the destruction of organized labor, any of those things. The problem is you and your failure to go out and get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or, or a Ph.D. That's the problem, that you didn't study hard enough, and that's why you're failing. So it's, it's meritocracy. The, so the meritocracy really is, is not a solution to uh, inequality. Meritocracy is a way of excusing inequality. You know, it's a way of rationalizing inequality. But then, I mean, I also take on the idea of education in all sorts of very, uh, very particular ways. It comes up again and again and again. I mean, when, when, I, when you suggested that one of these days education is going to become a part of the problem, and I said it already is, it's because of the, 
it's now become so expensive, right? All our presidents for the last well, however many years have been telling everybody that they have to get a college degree. All our high school uh, principals are telling us that. All our guidance counselors, all our parents, everybody knows you have to get a college degree. So what do the colleges do? They they jack up the uh, price of tuition, you know, so it's super duper high. So the place I went to graduate school, Coy, is now sixty grand a year Jeez. to go. Yeah, seriously. Oh if you went to that for four years, that's almost a quarter of a million dollars. And nobody has that kind of money. For no job. You, no, you nobody. Have no, yeah. not, not even the 1%. Nobody has that kind of money lying around. Okay, maybe the 1%. That's where we're at. And uh, so you go get a college degree, and heaven forbid you go out and get a Ph.D. and you take out student loans to do it, you're going to be starting life with the equivalent of a mortgage hanging over your head and no house. No house to sell, right? You're just in debt for the rest of your life, and you've got nothing to show for it, except for that you read, you know, you read a bunch of books and, and you got to eat in a fancy cafeteria for four years. It makes me so angry. And starting out life with this kind of debt is not a good thing. So there's a study of people with a college degree in certain demographics. People with a college degree came out of the Great Great Recession worse than people who didn't have a college degree. And the reason is, is because they borrowed. You know, they did everything yep, right. Yep. They did everything like President Obama tells them to do. And, and look what's happened to them. Their and you know what? has been destroyed. Tom, it makes perfect sense if you, if you really accept the fact that America is not, a, as Michael Hudson writes, it's not a consumption, consumption production economy anymore. It's an economy that relies on the manufacturing of debt. Because debt service, if, if everybody's paying their money towards debt, that's going to end up benefiting a very small fraction of the population versus the kind of economy you read about in high school uh, where people make things and then they buy things. And, but if everybody's paying on debt, that's where you have – you ensure the financial success of, of an oligarch class, of, of an elite class. So America now, both parties have accepted this notion that America is – our great manufacturing product is debt. That's what we make. And now they've lassoed education into that very same formula. So college kids yeah. leave with hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of dollars in debt. They can't get the new house. They can't get the wash and dryer. They can't buy the new car. They're lucky if they find a job to even pay their bills. And again, we come right back to this point that foments social unrest. That's where revolution. Can I just throw one thing in there? Yeah. We are the heirs of Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what he wanted, remember? This is and what he, he wanted. wanted. He wanted debt. Uh, he wanted federal debt, and then he wanted uh, bondholders. He wanted an attached to it. But, but, but the economy, the, the country was going to be based on debt. Absolutely. Uh, it was kind of a genius idea at the time. Right, right. <laughs> I, don't know if I, I don't know if I like it any longer, though. Tom, I want to try to end on a positive note, and I'm going to read you an excerpt from Listen Liberal, and I just want you to respond to it. Uh, you write at the very end of Chapter 10, you write, in truth, we have been hearing some version of all of this in you know, talk since the 1970s, a snarling Republican iteration which demands our submission before the almighty entrepreneur and a friendly and caring Democratic one which promises to patch us up with job training and student loans. What each version brushes under the rug is that it doesn't have to be this way. Economies aren't ecosystems. They aren't naturally occurring phenomena to which we must learn to acclimate. Their rules are made by humans. They are, in a word, political. In a democracy, we can set the economic table however we choose. Our fate is not sealed, Tom Frank. We, we do have the ability to create the kind of country we want, where money can benefit schools and you know the 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 the, uh, the kind of vision that Bernie Sanders has that governments take money from people we do tax people we have fees we collect money we can spend that money to benefit people or we can give it to a small fraction of the citizenry and continue to make an oligarchic elite class even more wealthy it's our decision that's exactly right that's exactly right I, you know I've been having a lot of sort of existential moments lately where you, I walk down the street and look at my, my, my fellow Americans and, you know, either, you know, these very smug, sort of contented, um, uh, suburban, you know, McMansion types or these, these people that are, that are, that are really suffering. And, and, and every now and then it just, it just dawns on me with, um, this sort of overpowering force, the fact that 
we could choose to do everything differently if we wanted. You know, it's totally within our power. I mean, and I hope the day comes when we do choose to, you know, change a few things uh, pretty pretty dramatically. But uh, I don't know, Coy. The, I mean, I, I'm both I'm both very negative these days, as you heard earlier, but I'm also positive. The the, the Bernie Sanders uh, phenomenon has been very healthy in a lot of ways, uh, but the Trump phenomenon is very frightening, and we're going to see how it plays out. The book is Listen Liberal, or Whatever Happened to the Party of the People. Best-selling, award-winning, celebrated author Tom Frank, a graduate of Mr. Jefferson's University. Tom, it's always a thrill to talk to you, sir, and hopefully we can do this again soon. I'd really look forward to that. Anytime, Coy. The pleasure's all mine. You've been listening to the Citizens Band Radio Hour, a production of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. Archived podcasts are available online at mediaandcitizenship.org. The executive producers for the program are Siva Vadianathan and Koi Barefoot.